Hey everyone, so we are covering now chapter 18, which is actually, I mistakenly said the shampooing is the shortest. This chapter is the shortest one in your textbook, chapter 18, um, braiding and braiding extensions. You only have a few number of vocabulary words you gotta memorize for your test and some skills. Only two learning objectives. You wanna explain how to prepare the hair for braiding and two is to demonstrate the procedure for cornrowing. So I love how the book starts off, it talks about the history of braiding, which is so important to know. This is stuff that we don't even hear in history, but I think is so neat. Braiding has its origins in Africa. Different African tribes use braiding for determining certain things like social status or braid for certain festivals. It's used in so many ways. So now um, braiding styles are used um, as a social identity because braiding is part of someone's culture, it's your identity. This chapter is so important to um, be an advocate because in cosmetology, we do do advocacy work even though we don't think about it. One of the things that hurts me so much as a stylist is when I, or a cosmetologist too, when I hear stories like people being refused an education because of their braided hairstyle or their long hair if they're um, a guy. I've heard of people being refused an education for having a different colored hair because they dye it or they color it. I've had the recent one where someone, the student was Rastafarian, had dreadlocks, and the school says, cut your hair or don't come into class. And I'm glad his parents said, no, we're gonna fight this. So it's really important to advocate and create that social change because you should not deny someone a job or an education based on the color of their hair, the style of the hair, the length of their hair, because that reinforces, when you deny someone education like that, that reinforces negative stereotypes, gender stereotypes, um, it's a way of discrimination. It's really disgusting how we still see that today, but this is something that we will change by working together. So know that um, hair braiding reached its peak of social and aesthetic significance in Africa, where it's always been regarded in art form, and it was handed down from generation to generation. So typically, you would have an older, wiser person teach the next generation, and it would keep going and going, and that's how braiding really evolved. The art form of braiding can take a lot of hours. There are some elaborate hairstyles of braids in specific cultures that will take an entire day to complete, and these styles are meant to be worn long term. Braiding salons, which are a thing, usually have one person that will see a client for three to four hours at a minimum, and at a maximum six to eight, depending on the style, or even longer. Braiding has so many um, opportunities now in the salon. You can do fashion braiding, cultural braiding, so it's really important to know that. Make sure that you know that there's many African tribes. One of them is a Zulu. They were and are still identified by their distinctive hairstyles and they involve braids. As early as 3000 BC, Egyptian women wore braids or plates with decorative shells, sequins, glass, or gold beads. Ancient paintings from India show women with long, heavy braids. And additional evidence shows the Anazazi, who around 100 AD, populated what is now American Southwest, favored braids as did later Native Americans. The Anazazi were the precursors to the Native Americans, a really older tribe. One of the important parts to know about history is that in the 60s and 70s, we had a revival of cultural hairstyles or a way of um, a social protest. So a lot of um, black people were wearing you know, their locks, their braids, the Afro became popular, and that was a way of going against um, the, the, what had previously been making your hair straight, relaxers, things like that. It was a way of embracing who you were as a person and your own culture. So at this time in the 60s and 70s, there was a banning of wearing braids in many professions and even high schools, which later turned into lawsuits. We are still dealing with this today. Suppression was followed by acceptance and mainstream adaptation, and today's braids are accepted as any other hairstyle in most modern workplaces. The exception is being certain police academies and even the military do not allow braids and dreadlocks, sadly. So that is another area where you wanna fight. We also have braiding salons, which are known as um, either ethnic salons or natural salons. And they're all around the United States. They practice what's called natural hairstyling. Know this for your test. Natural hairstyling is styling without the use of chemicals, dyes, and does not alter the natural curl or coil pattern of the hair. So, People of all heritage and ethnicities can embrace braids, and this is the other thing to be mindful of. You can be Spanish and wear cornrows, you could be white and wear cornrows, you can be a mix of um, cultures and races and wear cornrows. You don't have to be of a specific ethnicity, and that's just the really cool thing about this. I had a friend who was 100% Irish, he wears, um, he had dreadlocks for many years and he just got bored and you know cut them off. But it's important to be mindful of that and that encourage that because that causes you know people to get along, it allows you to learn about another culture. It's just such a powerful thing and we have the ability to do that for people. 
and help them. So know that natural styling can be elaborate, simple, traditional, or trendy. There's so many versions of this. Natural hairstyling could also um, inspire creativity as a hair artist. You can maybe do, if you're doing an updo, do some like, you know, cornrows in there. I once did a half updo where I did three cornrows going back and made like this really cool um, slanting but vertical uh, section in the updo. There's so many ways to have fun with this. Know that braided styles may take hours to complete depending on the braids, the more complex the style. Uh, know that they're not, the more complex the style, the longer the time you'll have to wear it. Know that these styles are not disposable. Nothing is worse than when you spend six hours in someone's hair and they call you back and say, well, I need to take these out, I don't want them in. And then you have to take all that work out after you did it for that long. It's usually how you end up getting burnt out as a stylist. Um, and consultation is important as everything is. So with braiding, you must analyze the hair. The scalp has to be in good condition. You want to know the texture of the hair, the diameter of the hair. Is the hair coarse, medium, or fine? Does the hair feel oily, dry, hard, soft, smooth, coarse, or wiry? What is the wave pattern or coil configuration? A coil, know this is a very tight curl. It is a spiral in formation, and when lengthened or stretched, it resembles a series of loops. For the purpose of this chapter, know when you're reading this that textured hair refers to hair with a tight coil pattern. In addition to texture, you want to know the density. So you want to see any areas of the hair is thin because that might pop out when you're braiding or when you're making your lines if you're doing cornrows, it could become visible. Know the condition of the hair. You want to check for damage um, from any other services. If hair is too damaged, like bleached, you have to be very gentle to use less tension. If hair is really, really damaged, um, don't braid it because you actually can cause breakage and traction alopecia if you're way too tight. So know um, that when you're talking in the context of a natural salon, um, in the natural hairstyling and braiding world, hair is referred to as natural or virgin if it has never been chemically treated. Some people even use a term more um, narrowly, narrowly, and they'll say that natural hair is also hair that is not exposed to thermal styling tools. The reason being, in like the last chapter when I explained, when you're using the pressing comb and you're pressing the hair, if you do it too tight, you can actually damage the structure of the hair, damage the hair's proteins, and that will cause the hair to permanently relax in the ends. So you'll see people that have really tight curl or coil, and on the ends, it's for two or three inches uh, more relaxed. So, Techniques used in natural hairstyling include braiding of extensions. There is twisting, which is defined as the overlapping of two strands to form a candy cane effect, and weaving, which is interweaving a weft or faux hair with natural hair, wrapping and locking to create what are often called African locks or dreadlocks. Some states will also have separate licenses or certifications of natural hairstyling. Um, it's important to be aware of this. I know in my state of New Jersey, it just became allowed to, you can legally braid hair in the salon as a braider and you don't have to be a cosmetologist, where before you had to have a cosmetology license to do services in a salon. My state is pretty tight and strict with that. In other states, I know you don't even need a license in certain states to shampoo hair, style hair, and braid. Some states it might be a separate license or it might be a certification thing. It's very different. So I can't give you a direct answer here. You're gonna have to call your state board if you wanna know what the rules are for your state. So a specialist who specializes in braiding in natural hair um, would be called a braider, natural hairstylist, or loctitician. Know that loctitician is also spelled L-O-C-T-I-C-I-A-N or L-O-C-K-T-I-C-I-A-N. They have a loctitician license as opposed to a full cosmetology license and they cannot perform chemical services such as barbering, straightening the hair, things like that. Know too that there's a cultural background that for African Americans, braided styles are a proud acknowledgement of their cultural heritage. So make sure you're always mindful of that when you're learning. Um, but anyone of different um, cultures can enjoy these styles. So when you're also going to um, analyze the hair, make sure that hair is long enough and physically long enough to hold the hair. Someone with a buzz cut is not getting braids, obviously. Someone with short hair, it really depends. If the hair is too short, it could be a pain, but you can do it if you're experienced. You want to make sure the scalp is healthy and that it's not tight. Typically, you'll use the word tender-headed. Someone who's tender-headed, if you braid the hair, they'll feel it and it goes, oh, ow, it hurts. That gets better after you massage the scalp, use some conditioning treatments. It might take some prep work to get someone's hair ready for braiding if they've never had tight braids before. So when you're braiding, um, 
they always say artists are artists are only as good as their tools, and this is important because you, you want good tools, but you also want to know the trade to do this correctly. Know that you'll be using a boar bristle, bristle or natural hairbrush. This um, removes dirt and lint from locks. The nylon bristles bristles are not as durable and may snag the hair, um, but there are soft nylon brushes. There's a square soft paddle brush. It's good for releasing tangles and knots and snarls out of the hair. They can also, um, they call square paddle brushes, they call them pneumatic because they have a cushion of air in the head that makes the bristles collapse when they encounter too much resistance. This is key to preventing breakage and fragile um, African American hair. You can have your vent brush, which is a single or double row of widely spaced pins with protective tips, preventing tearing and breaking in the hair. The vent brushes are used to gently remove tangles on wet or dry curly hair, as well as on human hair extensions. You always want to check the protective um, tips on the brush because if the tips, like the tips right here, if any of them are missing, it's going to snag and scratch a hair, and that's when you know you got to replace your brush. Typically, they last about a year or over. Your wide tooth comb, these are going to be the combs you're using to detangle the hair, or you may use a wet brush. It really depends on what you're used to. The double tooth or the detangling comb is used to separate the hair, and it's great for detangling um, wet curly hair. Your tail comb is excellent for design parting, sectioning large segments of hair, and opening and removing braids, because you're able to get in there with the tail, pull them apart, and then unwind them. Your finishing comb is usually eight to 10 inches in length. It's for, um, finishing combs are used while cutting. They work well on finer straight hair. Your cutting comb is used for cutting small sections. It should be used only after the hair is softened and elongated with a blow dryer. Your pick or rounded teeth, this is useful for lifting and separating textured hair. It has long, widely spaced teeth and is commonly made of plastic, metal, or wood. You have a blow dryer with a pick nozzle. Your pick nozzle loosens the curl pattern and textured hair for braiding styles, and it dries, stretches, and softens textured hair. Use a hard plastic pick nozzle because the metal attachments become too hot. You also have the diffuser, and the diffuser will enhance your um, curl without disturbing the finished look and without dehydrating the hair. They also recommend using 5-inch scissors for trimming the bangs, creating some looks, long clips for sectioning, butterfly and small clips to separate um, hair into larger or small sections, your hood dryer, and your small rubber bands or string to secure the ends after you braid it, because when you braid you need to tie the end. Um, for the state regulatory alert, I'm going to read this to you guys. Locksticians specialize in creating and grooming locks, although some states may require them to hold a braider's license. They are not braiders, even if a locksticians license is the only license that you hold. State and federal agencies require you to take specific preventive measures. You may have to take extra classes. Just be aware that a lot of this is about knowing the basics of disinfecting, and a lot of it is common sense. You know, you want to be clean, spray your area down. What you may need to know is that you know certain things that you would think like Lysol you can or can't use or they recommend using barbicide things like that are all important because that's what the heart of our license is is doing things the sanitary way before we get into the fun stuff so now um, with braiding um, if you're going to make extensions from scratch and this can be a very lucrative business I've known stylists that get their cosmetology license take additional classes in natural hair and they'll take specialty, specialty classes in extensions and wigs and they make their living off designing and styling wigs which is a huge money maker so in order to make your own you will need extension fibers a hackle and a drawing board your extension for, um, fibers come in a variety of types and this will be on your test Connecleon which is a special type of plastic Nylon, rayon, human hair, yarn, lin, and yak. Your hackle, a hackle is a board of fine upright nails through which human hair extensions are combed and they are used for detangling or blending colors and highlights in. So if you're making a row, you can do your base color, you can add some highlights in and add a few darker strands in for lowlights. And your drawing board, drawing boards are flat leather pads with very close fine teeth that sandwich human hair extensions. These pads are weighed down with um, books allowing specific amount of hair to be extracted without loosening and disturbing the rest of the hair during the process of braiding. Typically you're going to buy your extensions pre-made. What they'll do is they'll take the hair, fold it in half, and then they'll sew it together and it's remy so it's all going in the same direction. Or they may cut it so the cuticle is all in the same direction to make it remy. So all that matters. You have a whole bunch of materials for um, extensions. 
typically what you want for extensions is you want to get 100% Remy human hair. That is the gold standard in extensions. I know it's hard to obtain. Um, not, not that it's hard to obtain, but it can be very pricey. And the other issue with this is that if you get a shade you don't like, um, it, you have to customize it. So this is my own professional um, tip to you guys because I do extensions. When I get extensions, I always err on the side of getting a lighter one. It's easy to take a light extension that's human hair, use a demi or semi-color, and then darken it to match their hair, as opposed to getting a darker shade and lifting it, because that will compromise the extension, and your life expectancy of that extension is not nearly as strong enough. I also try to find extensions that are not um, processed as much, so I tend to go for Remy hair that is not processed, that is also um, free of any metallics, because that will react violently and break off. And then I look for ones that are not coated because if you get a coated um, wig or even extensions, the life expectancy is like very, very short. It's only a few washes before it gets really gross and you gotta, you know, recycle it. I hear a lot of stylists say that when they specialize in wigs, they don't make them like they used to make them, which is very true. So make sure you know your brands, go out there, experiment around, um, ask them for a swatch ring. Typically they'll give you a ring. I think I have one right here. They give you a ring with many different um, colors and swatches to choose from, and that is that specific manufacturer. They may run dark, they may come in different textures. There's so many options. So what I'll do is I'll let you guys take an early five minute break. I'm gonna come back, we're gonna talk about all the materials, working with wet or dry hair and braiding, some types of braids, and then we'll talk a little bit about cornrows and locks, and we should be able to get this done in two videos, but I make no promises. <laughs> 